Okay, good morning, everybody. Uh, and uh, uh, thank you for all the participants for taking time for today's learning session. And today we're going to have a session on the topic of international opportunities for engaging and growing as an evaluator, uh, liberating perspectives from the United States. And we are having uh, two great uh, speakers or presenters for today's session. Uh, Dr. Esther Norton and Amy Jersil. So uh, first of all, let me introduce briefly about the Mongolian Evaluation Association, for whom do not have any understanding or never heard about the organization. So uh, Mongolian Evaluation Association, or MEA, was established in 2021st with the vision of developing evaluation field in professional level. In other words, promote, promoting a professionalization and institutionalization of evaluation at the national level. To achieve this vision, uh, MEA promotes the application and standards of scientific evaluation methods in development policy and programs of Mongolia, and also develops capacity of Mongolian evaluators and advocates for value of evaluation in the country. Uh, also, MEA became a member of the International Organization for Cooperation in Evaluation and cooperates closely with different stakeholders such as American Evaluation Committee, Washington Evaluators, and international organizations, and also universities and experts in the evaluation field. So today's learning session is the continuation from yesterday's first session on the topic of impact evaluation and the realist evaluation within the framework of the Glocal Evaluation Week event. So today we are going to have a very special speakers representing the evaluation field. So let me introduce them. Uh, first speaker is Dr. Easter Nolton. Uh, who is a program officer in the evaluation and analysis division of the strategy and planning department at the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute. Uh, she currently serves as an integral leader, manager, and a member of several cross-cutting groups and initiatives across the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute. So in addition to these roles, uh, she is also an active leader within the American Evaluation Association and also Washington Evaluators, including as the immediate past president of Washington Evaluators. So she is an established methodologist, evaluator, and facilitator with specializations in quantitative measurement, survey, and qualitative methodologies. So, uh, in terms of her educational background, she received a Bachelor of Science in Athletic Training with minors in Psychology and Biology from George Mason University, and also Master's in Education in Kinesiology with a focus in Sports Medicine from University of Virginia, and also Doctorate Degree in Research and Evaluation Methods with a Secondary Specialization in Health and Education Policy from George Mason, University. And also our next speaker is Amy Jersil. She is a PhD candidate in Western Michigan University's interdisciplinary PhD in evaluation program. She has worked in the international development sector for over 20 years and has conducted independent evaluations for the United Nations and also private donors and bilateral donors, primarily in Asia and in the Middle East for over 15 years of experience. So from 2014 to 2018, she served as assistant professor in the Sustainable Development Master's Degree Program at School for International Training Graduate Institute in Washington, DC. So her research interests include the professionalization and internationalization of evaluation practice, which uh, basically matches with the MEA uh, vision in Mongolia. So today's learning session will focus on the understanding of the international landscape of evaluation practice, particularly the network of voluntary organization of 
professional evaluation, their membership and interest in furthering evaluation capacity. So the presenters will share their experience as evaluators and members of the American Evaluation Association, and also share opportunities for engagement in professional development in the USA. So we believe that this session will uh, let all of you, the participants, to reflect on your role as an evaluator or knowledge on the evaluation sector and to be proactive in fathering your evaluation capacity. So let's start our session and please welcome our first presenter. Thank you. Um, we're, we're pleased to be here and um, to engage with you on this topic. Um, I will speak, um, we have the same deck of slides and I will speak to um, just initially some uh, definition around our topic uh, and also the, the sort of the international landscape as it pertains to capacity building or capacity development and, and evaluation. Um, and, then, and then conclude with some trends. Um, Esther will then um, present specific to the United States and opportunities um, for, for engaging and um, accessing professional uh, development um, uh, initiatives. And um, so we're, we're happy to be here. Thank you. Um, next slide, please. So that we'd start by just giving some definition to it to evaluation um, and a, a very common, um, very practical definition uh, um, and and the American evaluation um, um, uh, showcases this on their on their website um, is is to understand it as a systematic process to determine the merit worth or significance of a program policy personnel or other kind of thing or evaluand uh, that is to be assessed or evaluated. And when we when we think about the merit of, of, of something, we think about the value, uh, sort of an intrinsic value that something may have, a goodness um, that may be identified in the absence of context or cost. In contrast, worth uh, refers to the merit that considers the context and, and cost uh, and significance. Um, then relates to the value and the need and the importance to, to those stakeholders to that particular evaluand. Um, we also think in terms of a logic of evaluation. Um, and uh, this is generally a four step process of defining criteria of, of how we think about good or goodness, um, set standards within those criteria, uh, develop evidence, an evidence base, um, and then make a judgment. Uh, so this is a, a common sort of logic uh, that we also think about uh, with regard to evaluation. Next slide. Um, evaluators are a diverse, extremely diverse bunch. Um, they are a very diverse group with diverse backgrounds, experiences, trainings, and skills. Um, Perhaps what is common is that we all have methods upon which to draw and theories uh, within our, our backgrounds. Uh, and our backgrounds can be within the economics field, education, sociology, anthropology. Um, uh, there's so many disciplines uh, that, that people are engaged in and, and sort of come within the evaluation field with. Um, Evaluators are found in many places. They're found within organizations, uh, so internal to organizations, um, or they are external. And, and this is a sort of a, a, a phenomenon called independent evaluation, uh, where um, uh, an, an evaluator that is external or independent of an evaluation, an, uh, uh, an organization that undertakes an evaluation. We are also found in the private sector, the public sector, um, as well as in academia. Uh, so, uh, so great diversity and also uh, in background as well and skills um, and training as well as diversity in, in where we work. 
Um, and currently, there is no official licensing body for evaluators. There, there's quite a bit of discussion about credentialing, um, and, and Esther will talk a little bit more about that within the context of the US um, and some of the debates on that. But licensing um, is, is not something that we find anywhere in the world at this point. Even though we are not a licensed profession, um, we're, we do very important things. Um, evaluation is really, really quite important. Um, I, I draw here from the Joint Committee um, uh, for the, the Standards on Educational Evaluation, uh, which sets standards for um, evaluation in Canada and the US. And they describe evaluation as multi purpose um, uh, involving decision making, judgments, conclusions, findings, new knowledge, organizational development, capacity building in response to the needs of identified stakeholders. Um, it speaks to the leading to improvement, um, also accountability, uh, and ultimately um, contributing to organizational betterment um, and um, of particular importance, uh, social value. And, and this, is, this is also a, a, a lively sort of discussion within the evaluation field about um, sort of the, the, the common good and evaluation as serving sort of going beyond the organizational level to, to societal and um, how, how can we best contribute toward the common good. Next slide, please. So I'll speak uh, to sort of the, the international evaluation architecture uh, sort of in place. Um, it, it, it really is quite complex um, involving um, uh, multilateral donors, the UN, um, bilateral donors, um, uh, um, also civil society organizations. And what I will focus on are, are VOPES um, as was referenced at the start of our session. So VOPES, or Voluntary Organizations for Professional Evaluation, is, is, a, is a rather young term, and VOPES are rather young themselves. Um, they are, uh, they've really, we've seen exponential growth across the globe. So in early 2000s, we had uh, only about 15 uh, VOPES, and now we have approximately 165 or so, 170 today. Um, so exponential growth in the past couple of decades. Um, as a membership organization, um, the concept of VOPEs are, are really quite important. They're quite critical, both for individual uh, skills building, individual professional development for its membership, as well as the field of evaluation and ways that um, VOPEs can uh, further advance evaluation as a field uh, within their respective contexts or countries. Um, I will um, just speak a bit to um, uh, what I've been learning in my own research uh, uh, with regard to the notion of advocacy and advancing um, evaluation. Uh, um, and advocacy is often understood by, by VOPES as a means for building the skills of their membership. And that's, that's often sort of understood um, uh, as, as how, how are we advancing um, evaluation within our national context, um, which is certainly certainly viable, certainly valid, uh, a, a way of thinking about that. Um, I, I point to an example of the Brazilian monitoring and evaluation network um, that is uh, applying its 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 membership or its leadership is is engaging in policy advocacy um, with regard to advancing evaluation and. The American Evaluation Association has done some of that as well, but this is taking taking a um, taking a bit further in terms of uh, advancing the field um, beyond beyond individual member capacity, um, uh, and and it's very contextual in the sense that um, you know they're coming out of a government coming from the Bolsonaro government that really suppressed. Um, voice suppressed um, um, the use of evaluation uh, to to getting into a more um, with Lulu's government seeing opportunity for change. Uh, so acting upon that opportunity, 
um, but then also liaising with others and, and um, very much focused on, on um, building alliances and, and moving forward a, an agenda. Um, and these these VOPES um, are are networked globally, which is which is an important uh, um, part of the architecture. Next, next slide, please. The International Organization for Cooperation and Evaluation is 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 a um, global organization that aims to strengthen international evaluation through the exchange of evaluation methods, theories, and practice. Um, and to promote good governance. And so both national associations like the Mongolian Evaluation Association, as well as regional associations like the Asia Pacific Evaluation Association, um, uh, of which MEA would also be a member of, um, are, are members of the IOCE. Next slide, please. The IOCE together with the UN has launched uh, what's called EVAL Partners, and many of you, particularly those of you who are engaged um, as young and emerging evaluators, this term has come from this, this network, this organization. Um, so the IOCE um, and the UN began EVAL Partners back in, in 2012, mm -hmm. so it's now over a decade old. Uh, and um, uh, it is engaged with now over 50 actors, um, it may be well over 50. I think this slide is a little bit dated now. Um, next slide, please. And the, you'll, you'll note from the object, their objectives uh, to then build individual skills capacity at the individual level, evaluators, as well as um, institutional capacities, including VOPEs or the associations, as well as a broader enabling environment for evaluation. Uh, so the, these objectives are then taken on by by its members um, and organize sub subgroups that have formed. Next slide, please. And these subgroups include Eval Youth, uh, which which is the young uh, and emerging evaluators um, uh, group uh, that has formed. And there are chapters all around the world. I, I believe MEA has one as well. Um, and this, this is, uh, uh, there's, there's been, uh, I think some impact that we have seen um, with, with these groups, and particularly Eval Youth in terms of the energy and the interest to really, um, to, to engage and um, develop capacity, um, not only at, at the individual level and provide those opportunities, but also to, to engage with the other groups. So we, we see more, more and more younger people um, active um, in eval indigenous, for example, eval gender. Um, so I, I really encourage you to explore all of these opportunities and, and get to know know this whole architecture and, and ways that you might further your own um, your own training as an evaluator. Next slide. So it, within the international field or international development field, there's been, um, there are quite a few trends that have sort of spilled over to the evaluation field. Um, and they involve sort of dialogue about um, localization in aid. Uh, so localizing assistance um, and, um, and this is sort of coincided with discussion around um, decolonization uh, and, and um, uh, uh, social justice, climate justice. I mean, there's been a whole lot of um, uh, debate about this. Um, uh, and that has spilled over into the evaluation field uh, with the idea that we're, we're moving away, we aim to move away from a donor-driven evaluation uh, uh, field um, to to one that is is growing from within, uh, and that where governments are taking on a larger role um, in both commissioning, demanding, being a, a, an actor that demands evaluation um, and uses it properly, and um, a new UN resolution just recently where um, which focuses on um, uh, country led evaluation. 
uh, in support of realizing the sustainable development goals. And so that's been an important milestone for the for the UN. Um, another area that has um, that we've seen uh, another trend is, as I mentioned, increasing global coordination and participation by young and emerging evaluators. Um, increasing um, debate on what evaluation should do, um, and then how evaluation is practiced, uh, particularly during the pandemic. Next slide, please. I'll, I'll rush through these. Um, global challenges for evaluation relate to um, uh, going beyond just the individual evaluator to other stakeholders, other evaluation stakeholders, and developing standards around commissioning and using evaluation. Um, uh, deciding, well, you know, who, who are we as a field within each of our national contexts and what should education look like? And then um, a creation of material from within our, our, our cultures, our contexts, um, as well as access to programs across the globe, issues around distance and frequency, uh, as well as um, quality uh, is, is a concern as well. Final slide, please. Some promising practices that we see, um, uh, the use of virtual training, particularly since the pandemic, um, in, informal peer-to-peer -peer learning has, has really, there's a lot of energy around, around that, um, and efforts to define competencies, a lot of dialogue and movement on that, um, as well as eval youth, as I mentioned, and then a very combined practical approach with a theor theoretical background, um, which is giving grounding in theory, but in a very applied way. So th these, these are promising practices that we see across the globe. Thank you. Final Thank resource. You, oh, you go Thank ahead. You. Yeah, just, these are uh, just for the um, participants to to check these out, uh, we recommend um, to, to look at those and, and um, we'll, we'll share those in the chat. Thank you. Thank you so much, Amy. Um, uh, thank you everyone for being here. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you're joining us from. It's evening where I am. Um, so I'm really excited to continue this conversation. Thank you, Amy, for giving us the international landscape. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about the United States perspective. And I don't represent the perspective from all of the United States, but I am from the United States, so I can only share um, my perspectives from here. I don't know as much about the international landscape as Amy does, so I'm glad she opened with that. And then now we're going to um, provide a little bit more information specifically about the U.S. context. So um, Amy had alluded to this idea of credentialing for evaluation and where we are now with this. And so um, there, the, there's a big topic on professionalizing evaluation and whether we should or should not do that. Um, it's really been a worldwide debate where across the entire globe, there's been discussions about whether or not we should do that. Um, and it's happening at every nation um, in, in different ways. And I put an example here of like typically uh, in most countries, doctors and pilots, some high risk jobs that have a lot of liability assigned to them, um, have some type of certification or licensure process that is uh, associated or affiliated with their field to allow them to practice. And so that's a similar discussion that's happening in an evaluation and whether or not we should have some type of certification and licensure to practice. Um, there are some areas of the world that are making advancements in this area. One example is the Canadian Evaluation Society, or CES. They have actually developed a credential evaluator designation, and so it is a certification exam, and they get credentialed as an evaluator and practice as CEs or credentialed evaluators. Um, but really, there's still no consensus about this in the United States. I know Canada is not far away from us, but we're still trying to make decisions about that in the United States. Um, there have been ongoing dis debates even within the United States. If you look at the American Journal of Evaluation, 
Um, in the 1990s, there were a lot of debates going on back and forth about whether or not we should or shouldn't um, publicly within the journal. Um, and so those things are still continuing, those conversations are still continuing, and um, there are still a lot of outstanding questions that we have in the United States that are driving this decision. So things that we haven't really gotten clarification on are things like what are the required skills for to practice as an evaluator? Um, there hasn't been consensus on that. Um, how many evaluations or what type of evaluations does an evaluator need to do in order to maintain a credential? So sometimes like surgeons have to perform a certain number of surgeries a year in order to maintain their credentialing, um, you know, for professional development and to maintain their skills and to demonstrate that their skills are still there. Pilots might have to fly a certain amount uh, a year. And so there hasn't been an agreement in the field of evaluation of how often and how much and what type of evaluation evaluators need to do. Um, and then there are people who are more like me who work more in evaluation strategy and do less of the conduct of evaluation um, ourselves. And, you know, there's been debate about like, you know, are we considered evaluators? So you can see there's a lot of questioning around that. Who would oversee such a credentialing program? Would it be the American Evaluation Association? Would it be someone else? There's a lot of questions about that as well. And then what are the implications for liability? So really what is the risk for evaluators? Um, if you do a bad evaluation, how bad is that? You know, and, and what is the liability and who carries that liability? And um, you know, there are some professions that have liability insurance because their risk is so high. And so we need to consider those things as well. So there's a lot of things to consider here that um, we haven't thought enough yet about. And thank you, Amy, for dropping in the Canadian Evaluation Association website. You can look more there on their credential. Um, even though we don't have a credential in the United States, we do have what we call the evaluator competencies. So in 2018, the American Evaluation Association um, had put together a task force and they published these competencies to reflect what are the core competencies for any evaluator to expect um, to do in their uh, program evaluation practice. Um, and so there are five domains. There's actually many different um, competencies within these, but they organize these into these high level domains. And I just wanted to show you these so that you could see them, but you can um, go to the link in the chat to view the whole thing and you can uh, see what all the individual competencies are. And so broadly, the five domains are professional practice, methodology, context, planning and management, and interpersonal. And I won't go into detail about each of these in the interest of time, but there are just different aspects of professional practice and program evaluation that describe the types of activities and the types of responsibilities or duties that you might expect to have as a program evaluator. So even though we don't have a formal credential, we are arriving at an understanding of what are the required skills and competencies for an evaluator. So this should help folks think a little bit more about where are some areas that I need to work on, where are the areas that I want to develop, uh, where are the things that I can expect to exercise in my practice. All right. Um, so when we think about developing our skills in program evaluation, there's really a spectrum of professional development opportunities. So um, I've called these like loosely a range from informal to formal. And so informal can be like self-facilitated, on your own, ad hoc, non-certified or non-systematic in a way. And formal can be very structured. There's a curricula involved. Um, it's a, maybe a degreed opportunity. And I'm providing an example of some of these here just along the spectrum. And there, this is not an exhaustive list by any means, but, and again, this is just from the US perspective, um, where on the very left-hand side with informal, we have on the job training and all the way to the right-hand side, we have university degree programs and everything in between. So this is just to give you an idea that there is a large range of opportunities out there and I don't want to give any perspective that either is good or bad or anything. And I'll, I'll talk more about that in a second. So working from the right over, I'm gonna cover each one of these big buckets of types of training so that you can get an idea of what that looks like. So 
For university degree programs, there are many different types of academic institutions that offer a range of degrees. So anywhere from doctoral degrees um, to masters, there's also graduate certificates and maybe even undergraduate education as well, although I've seen less of that focus on evaluation. Um, and there are some programs that have formal degrees that are wholly in evaluation, like your degree actually says it's in evaluation, or you can get a degree in public health and specialize in evaluation, for instance. So it could be a specialization, but the degree itself is not in evaluation. Um, and some offer individual courses. So the whole degree is not in evaluation. You're not specializing necessarily in evaluation, but you have um, some individual courses that you could take. Um, and so you can look at all these different options. Neither one of them are bad or good or anything. It's just, you know, you have to think about if you're looking at a degree program, what is the best fit for you? And ultimately, what do you want your degree to be in? And where do you want to build your skills? So if you don't want your degree to be an evaluation and you want to specialize or you want to just supplement with evaluation courses, that's an option as well. And I put some other options here that um, you can consider to supplement your degrees. Um, you can also explore possibly other courses across the um, university, other schools, departments. Um, there are some opportunities where you can take courses from outside of your specific department and transfer courses over or let, allow it to count towards your degree. Um, you can also look into doing internships. Um, I did this uh, when I was doing my doctorate, and it was a great way to supplement practical experience because in the classroom, it's a little bit harder to learn some of that stuff. In America, uh, our university degree programs, we also have something called an independent study. I don't know if you all have that uh, in places where you are, um, but this allows you to study something independently as it sounds, and you work with a faculty member to kind of describe or define your course of study for that course, and you can tailor it to what you want to learn about. Um, and it could be very specific, it could be more broad, and every university does this differently, but that could be an opportunity for you to kind of craft something if there's not a lot of options there for you. Um, and then lastly, I've suggested a lot of people to do this as well. If you don't have any of these other options where you have a formal course or a specialization or a degree in evaluation that you can pursue, surely in every class that you're taking, you probably have some type of class project or a paper that you have to write and you can write about an evaluation um, use case or evaluation context, um, or you can find some way to work it into some of your existing courses. And I've seen a lot of students do this really successfully and still get a lot out of the, the course um, in a dual kind of way where you're getting something for that course content, but also um, in an evaluation uh, scenario or use case. The next I want to talk about are third party institutions. So these aren't university programs per se um, in the traditional sense that they're not degree programs, um, but they are institutions um, that offer some training that you can sign up for. And these tend to be a little bit more affordable than a degree program. Um, and I know in the pandemic, a lot of them became virtual. So and a lot of them have stayed virtual. So that might be also another thing to consider. Um, some of them are also asynchronous and you can do it on your own time. And so, you know, there's some other kind of flexibility that can be offered here. Um, so I'm dropping, uh, Amy's dropping in links for me here in the chat that include all of these different institutions. I'm not endorsing any one of these at all or anything. These are just ones that I have seen offer some pretty decent evaluation courses. Um, they're mostly either like workshop style or some type of course that has multiple modules in it. And so um, some of them are multi-day courses. Some of them are multi-month courses where you can um, self-pace over time. There's a lot of different options there. And I tried to um, put a array of options here so that you can explore them yourself. I'm sure there's more third-party institutions that offer uh, these types of courses and maybe even more wherever you're located if you're not in the United States. Um, but I'm pretty sure also a lot of these are accessible from outside of the United States as well. Um, but you can explore the course offerings that they have and um, just take a look at what might be a good fit for you. Again, thinking about those core competencies and 
um, areas that you want to improve your skills, then you can go and, and search for opportunities here. So on the next slide, um, I want to talk about um, the American Evaluation Association. So the American Evaluation Association is the premier organization for um, professional development and uh, community uh, community of practice for evaluators in the United States. Um, and so it is one of the VOPEs, as um, Amy mentioned, and it is our national organization for the United States. Um, as you can see in this slide, there are a, a lot of really great things that AEA offers. Um, and I won't list all of these or talk about all of these, but there are a mix of community of practices, courses that they offer, blogs, um, and then smaller communities like TIGs or topical interest groups and local affiliates. Well, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about those. They have two flagship journals related to this um, American Evaluation Association. One is the New Directions for Evaluation Journal, and then the other one is the American Journal of Evaluation. Um, and there's a ton of other stuff here that I won't go into deeply, but members who are part of this organization have access to all of these things. Um, and I know for certain that you can be an international person and be a member. Um, I know some of you here are members of AEA. And so um, it can be largely beneficial to you to be part of AEA. Um, but as Amy mentioned before, there are other VOPEs around the um, globe. And so you have other options as well. If AEA doesn't feel like a good fit for you for any reason, um, for instance, if you want to pick one that's closer to you, you can always find one on the, the map um, the, and find one closer to you to join. Um, but because of the pandemic, a lot of these organizations are offering a lot of virtual content as well. And so that sort of breaks down the barrier of needing um, an organization that's close in proximity to you. AEA has two training opportunities in particular that I wanted to highlight. Um, one of them is the JEDI internship, and then the other one is the MSI fellowship. Um, these are two really, really great programs. The internship that I mentioned I did when I was a doctoral student was the JEDI program through the AEA. Um, and it is a program that was developed like 20 years ago. I think they're about to start their 20th cohort. Um, specifically to broaden participation of underrepresented groups in evaluation. Um, so the JEDI program is a cohort style program. And so you apply around the spring of every year. So the application has already closed for this upcoming year. And then um, it off offers or affords a 10 month internship for scholars at uh, different host sites. So there are different host sites that apply, scholars that apply, and then if you're part of a graduate program, you can apply as a scholar and you can get placed at a host site from um, somewhere around the United States. It's a pretty competitive program. So there are probably around like 80 applicants a year as scholars, and there's only about a dozen selected. So about 12 scholars every year. Um, but it is a really, really great program. If you're part of a graduate education uh, program, some type of degree program in the United States, um, it's really, really worth applying for. And especially um, if you identify as some type of underrepresented um, group member, then it's, it's definitely a great opportunity. And if you have questions about it, I'll pro provide my contact information at the end and we can talk more about that. The MSI Fellowship, the Minority Serving Institution Fellowship, is a fellowship for uh, people who are not in school, that are um, out of school, and are looking for additional uh, fellowship opportunities or training opportunities, um, uh, specifically from minority serving institutions or with minority serving institutions. This is also a really great program. I know a few people who've gone through it and have really found great value, especially if they didn't get a chance to be a Jedi um, while they're in their doctoral studies or their graduate studies. So um, really two great programs that I advise you look more into. And uh, we provided the links for both of those programs in the chat. Another great training opportunity, of course, is our annual meeting. So the American Evaluation Association has an annual conference. 
Um, it's usually around the fall time. So uh, this year it is the second week of October and it's gonna be held in Indianapolis, um, Indiana. Um, it changes location every year, but it's always in the United States and it's always somewhere between October and November. Um, and every year, the president for that year chooses a different theme for the conference. And so this year, our uh, president, uh, Dr. Corey Whitmore, uh, has chosen the theme of the power of the story. And so I'm really excited to hear a lot of presentations about what stories and storytelling means to different evaluation evaluators and to their evaluation work. Um, I'm actually on the presidential conference committee and have been just hearing and, and seeing a lot of the conference shape um, together. So it's really, really exciting. I'm really excited for this year's conference, but it's it's one of my favorite conferences ever. Um, just the size and the the people there and everything. It's, it's one of my favorite places to visit. So um, no matter where it is uh, city wise. So if you get a chance to go, I would encourage you to try to travel <laughs> there. I know it can be quite far for, for some of you, but uh, I know Jim Gay and some others who have attended can say that it's uh, worth it because um, it is really, truly an extraordinary experience. So I just wanted to put that out there. It's We've already had uh, conference proposals go through, so those are currently being reviewed and decided upon soon. So um, it's too late to submit a proposal for this year, but it's not too late to register. The registration hasn't even opened yet, so you can keep an eye on that if you're interested in attending. And then every year, the uh, conference proposals will open around like March or April of each year. And so you can look out for that earlier in the year if you're looking to submit a proposal to present at AEA. Um, that would be an awesome opportunity also for you to attend and learn and share. So the next thing I wanna share about is AEA's local affiliates. Um, so this is one of the um, smaller communities of practice within AEA. So AEA is so large and it covers such a vast geographic area that um, it has created these local affiliates or like regional chapters, smaller chapters across the United States. Um, and so there are, I believe, 36 um, local affiliates now. And this is not all of them. I just tried to pull as many logos as I could. Um, but this is just a sample of what is out there. And you can see that it really ranges all across the United States. Um, so thank you, Amy, for dropping in that link. You can see that the local affiliates page lists all of the local affiliates and some contact information. Um, and to just give you a little bit more idea about how to get in contact or, you know, get involved with these communities. And specifically, I wanted to share a little bit more about Washington Evaluators. You heard in my bio that I am part of Washington Evaluators. Um, so I currently sit on the board as immediate past president, which means that I was president of Washington Evaluators last year. Um, and I was honored with that, um, that, that title and really got to lead a, a really fantastic group of 15 board members. Um, Washington Evaluators is actually one of the oldest local affiliates. We're actually older than the American Evaluation Association. Um, and we're one of the largest ones as well, uh, the one largest local affiliates. And so we've been around for a while, almost uh, four decades or so. And um, we have really had so much history and experience in building great programming for professional evaluators, specifically in the Washington DC region. So that was our charge, but in the pandemic, I will say that we grew a lot and we have members from all over the world now. Um, so if you are interested in joining the Washington evaluators, you're more than welcome to, and the link is in the chat for you to explore that. Membership is only $25 US dollars a year for professional members and 15 for student members. Um, so it's, it's quite affordable and we offer a, a bunch of different things for our members. So here's a list of things and I won't talk about them specifically, but we have a member digest that goes out weekly and it includes some articles, some you know, good readings, events, and it also includes job opportunities. Um, they're specifically based in the Washington DC area. So if you're looking for a job in the Washington DC area, 
there are some people who join Washington Evaluators for that reason, just to um, get a view into those opportunities. Um, in addition to that, we put on a bunch of events for different reasons, professional development, networking, social, and we also have a couple of programs as well. Um, Evaluation Without Borders is a great pro bono um, evaluation opportunity so that allows you as an evaluator to volunteer yourself and your skills, your time and everything um, to help a local nonprofit with their evaluation needs. And um, so you're offering free services and that means that an organization that might otherwise not be able to afford evaluation services or isn't too sure about evaluation yet can learn about it and you can also learn more about evaluation as well. Um, we have Career Connections, which is a mentorship program, scholarships for new professionals, students, and uh, new emerging evaluators, and also university ambassadors. We have over 20 universities um, and institutions around our area um, in the Washington, D.C. area, and so we have a large connection of all the universities and academic institutions here. And um, lastly, before we wrap up, I just want to talk briefly about on the job training as well. So I don't want to discount this at all because on the job training happens maybe more often than all of the other things that I mentioned. So this can be intentional or unintentional. It could happen by chance because you were assigned on a project and it happened to have some evaluative thinking or activities required of it, or it could be something that's like really intentional where it's like your job, um, your job title has changed, you are placed in um, a department that does evaluation. It could be a lot of different ways. Um, it happens a little bit more organically than some of the other ones. The other one op options that I said, you, you know, require some type of like identification of the need. You have to apply for it most of the time. It costs money. In this case, they're paying you to learn. So um, it's a great way for you to learn um, on the job, different scenarios and situations, methods, approaches. And it's the most practical way, obviously, to learn because you're learning in practice. Um, so I definitely wouldn't discount this to so those of you who are working in different situations and are looking for ideas or methods to break into evaluation or build your skills in evaluation, um, be seeking these opportunities as well. And if you're not sure how to seek those opportunities yet, I provided some prompts that you can start to ask yourself or of those around you to help you think about and, and find those opportunities that may not be explicit or obvious, but could be hiding um, and could be an opportunity for you to seek. So I won't read all these questions, but you can take a look at them and just see if any of these questions resonate with you and see if you can bring some of these questions to work with you um, sometime and see what happens. So on this last slide, I just wanted to share a little bit more about the benefits in general of bolstering your skills and evaluation. So, so why do this? Like, why does it even matter? Um, the reason why it matters is because building technical and essential skills um, are transferable really to any field. This isn't really just for evaluation, but evaluation is what we call is transdisciplinary. It's cross-cutting. And it applies to a lot of different things. Amy mentioned how there's a lot of different disciplines that care about evaluation and utilize evaluation skills. There are a lot of different sectors that use evaluation skills. And so there, it's just such a benefit to um, grow and, and build your capacity for these skills because you can use it literally anywhere. Um, you can also contribute to and be integrated within a community of practice. And so you can build a network grow and meet people and grow in your skills and build a community and be part of um, local and global communities. It's a really quite an amazing network of individuals. And because all of us bring so many different backgrounds and experiences to the work, you're always meeting really interesting people and just getting connected um, to really fascinating work and backgrounds and perspectives. And I always feel like I'm learning and growing by just meeting new people. Um, there is just a lot of knowledge out there and all you have to do is seek it out and get it. Um, so I have offered lots of different opportunities and options for you. Um, even if you're not in the United States and these don't seem attainable to you, I'm sure there are versions of this where you are. 
and you just have to look for it. So um, it's, it's not that there's not any options or opportunities to learn. There are plenty and you just need to seek them. And not all of them cost money. And so if that's a barrier for you right now, it doesn't mean that you have to make a huge monetary investment in, in growing your skills. I already talked about the diversity in skills and perspectives and how exciting that makes evaluation. But the last thing I just want to point out is that evaluation really is done in the spirit of continuous improvement. And so as evaluators ourselves, um, it's uh, great to have the spirit of continuous improvement as individuals as well. And so we should always be looking to grow our skills and, and try new things. Um, of the spectrum of opportunities that I talked about before, I will say also that we should all be doing all of these things. So it's not like you have to choose one and like, I'm going to choose the degree and nothing else, or I'm going to choose on the job um, training and nothing else. Really, you should be tapping into a spectrum of things, like a, a lot of different options and be growing your skills in different ways at, uh, at different times. And so this may change throughout your career at different seasons of your career. You may need different skills and different um, capacities and you can choose what's most appropriate for you at, in that season of your career. So there's lots of options out there um, and I hope this was helpful to you all. And so before we close out, I just want to leave some time, I know not as much time as we wanted, sorry, um, for some questions. So Surma, I will pass it back to you. Thank you, Amy and Esther, for both of you have a very great presentation. So hope uh, everyone of our participants get a valuable information and especially background information and educational opportunities in the evaluation field. So thank you so much. And uh, if any participants have questions or feedback, please unmute yourself or type in the chat. I can refer them. So before starting a question, I'm gonna raise one question. So uh, I have seen your uh, background. So both of you studied and studying PhD degrees in evaluation fields. So from your perspectives, um, what are the most important things that can be earned through university degree in the field compared to practical work experience or learning? And also, second question is, would you suggest us a university degree or a short-term courses for uh, those who is working in the evaluation field now? So. Amy, do you want to start? Sure, sure. Um, yeah, so so um, for myself, I I, I started, um, I had a master's degree um, and went into the international development field and, and did a, a range of things with programs. Um, so I was a program manager, a technical advisor to a program. Um, and then eventually, um, and, and these were for international NGOs as well as the UN, um, and then eventually got into then evaluating those programs. And I had focused on um, migration and labor, sort of the areas that I had the greatest expertise. Um, my, 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 um, my belief is that uh, you, 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 I, that evaluation is a practice um, and so a, applied work or experience doing evaluation is, is really critical and really valuable. Um, and Esther sort of identified quite a, quite a few ways to, to go about seeking that out, which, which was really helpful. Um, my, my sense is um, that a, generally a master's degree is, is really quite sufficient for knowing how to evaluate. Um, along with whatever other professional development opportunities that you want to seek. Um, at the PhD level, um, I think you, you get into um, more uh, um, research on evaluation, um, uh, a lot more depth into the, the historical, uh, the history of evaluation, more depth into the frameworks and, 
methods and approaches, um, which which are all great um, and and useful, and that's that's what I've sought to do. Um, but I'll, I'll I'll leave it at that and let let Esther carry on with her response. Thanks, Sammy. Yeah, I would agree. I think that there's really no right answer. Um, everyone has to decide their training options for themselves. Um, you know, I have a background in sports medicine for my bachelor's and master's, and I decided to pivot and, and get a degree in evaluation. Um, so that's why I got my PhD in evaluation. Um, like Amy, though, I don't think it's necessary to have a doctorate in evaluation to practice as an evaluator. Um, the master's degree programs and, and it, for example, the one that I teach in at American University is really designed to be more of a practical degree in teaching you how to practice and conduct evaluations. And at the doctoral level, you're really thinking of, as Amy said, like the theories and the why we do evaluations and um, the history of the field and practice and how we can advance that. Um, so most of our dissertations are going to be thinking about how we can advance the, the theory and practice of evaluation as a, a profession. You know, it's not, your dissertation is not an evaluation report, for instance. You know, it's not doing an evaluation and writing about that. Um, otherwise, everybody would have PhDs. Um, so it's, it's quite different, and the, the mindset and approach is quite different. It's not for everybody, and so a lot of times when people come up to me and say, I really want a PhD in evaluation. Can you tell me how to get there? I really want to know more about why they want a PhD in evaluation because it's really not necessary for everybody. So you kind of have to have a good reason for why you really need and want it. It's quite an investment monetarily and time. Um, so if you can, you know, get a great job and um, do the work that you want to do practically, then it's probably not necessary. Mm -hmm. uh, there is a question from Chinge. So for both speakers, so what are some good practices you have observed maybe at American Evaluation Association or at other WOPs that could be applicable to MEA to advocate evaluation at national level? to institutionalize evaluation for better policy making and evaluation. So uh, can you share your good practices? Yeah, I can start with this one. Amy briefly mentioned what's happening in Brazil. So I'll let her talk more about that because she definitely knows more about that than I do. Um, but the American Evaluation Association has been involved in some policy making at the national level for evaluation. Um, specifically, the, the American Evaluation Association has what they call the Evaluation Policy Task Force. Um, it is a task force of a couple of members across the association that is paying close attention to the policies that are happening in the federal government, the U.S. federal government specifically, um, related to policies um, that are demanding more evaluation or changing the landscape of evaluation and practice. Um, and so these are evaluation policies that may say like, for instance, the Evidence Act that was passed in 2019 that has now mandated all of the chief financial office agencies to appoint chief evaluation officers. It's required learning plans and learning strategies and um, all these things. It's mm -hmm. required all these things um, that has elevated evaluation to a new level. There's other stuff that's happening at state levels and indigenous governments and in other places as well. And so this task force is tasked with keeping an eye on those things and advocating for um, the profession and the field and, and helping those organizations or institutions, agencies um, build justification and the infrastructure to do that. So AEA plays a pretty important role in that area. And um, they're still growing in that um, effort as well. And I'm not sure about the Mongolian landscape, but if there are opportunities like that, it would be great for MEA to take that on as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those those are great ideas. I I um I can speak a bit more about the case of Brazil, which is a very interesting one. And um, I you know it's it's a it's a it's an environment of of extreme disparity and um, disparity. Dis 
extreme uh, economic and social disparities within within the Brazilian society. And they're also coming out of a, as I mentioned, with Bolsonaro's government, now, now with Lula's government, um, Lula's government um, uh, with, uh, presents an opportunity for change. Uh, so, so within that context, there's, there's quite an urgency and that has sort of led to uh, an ability to move an agenda forward. Um, so I, I think I think best practices sort of are contextualized as well, and and that matters. Um, you know where there is opportunity uh, to to take advantage of. I think I think they have been quite effective, in, and and this may be applicable for Mongolia that um, um, the leadership of the Brazilian monitoring and evaluation network started talking to other kinds of associations um, in Brazil uh, about evaluation. So, so seeking out um, alliances and growing those alliances um, are, from what I can also observe, um, to, be, to be quite effective. Um, uh, evaluation is not the domain for only um, uh, VOPES. Uh, there's, there are many other people uh, across multiple associations or other kinds of organizations that would also be concerned about evaluation and the, and, and the health of it as a field uh, or and the interest for its growth. So I think that's, that's, that's a best practice in terms of um, uh, building and developing rapport and um, uh, networks that then can um, um, more effectively sort of advocate and and push an agenda through vis-a-vis -vis the the government having an inside champion also helps um uh I, I i think that's also best practice you know to to seek that out and to find ways to to find a champion within who can move things forward too thank you good question Colorado. So if there is not another additional questions, uh, let's end our session here. So uh, thank you for both speakers. And it was our pleasure to hear about your experience as evaluators and opportunities for also educational and professional development in the evaluation field. Thank you so much for your sharing those extremely important and handful resources on the chat and throughout the lecture. So also thank you for the participants for taking time for the session. So hope to see you all in the next learning session and have a good day and have a good night, Emmy and Esther. Thank you so much. Thank you for having us. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. Bye-bye.